Hello, everyone. Seeing that participant number climbing on the right side of my screen, very exciting. I'll give everybody some time to join before we start our introduction here. Hello, everyone. <laughs> we will get started in just a moment. Waiting for that attendees number to kind of level off as people join. Super exciting. Glad everybody is here. <laughs> If, every, if anyone um, wants to send a message to um, all the other attendees and panelists, you can go ahead and type in the message there. Maybe say where you're coming from, where you're tuning in from, what you're excited to hear about, anything like that. Oh, someone from Austin. Very cool. Our Gainesville people. Fresno, I wonder why you're here. <laughs> awesome. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our very first Mushrooms with the Museum virtual edition. Um, my name is Chelsea, and I'm a museum educator at the Florida Museum. And along with Sarah Prentice from the Florida Academic Lichen and Fungi Enthusiast League, also known as Falafel. Um, say hello, Sarah. Hello. Um, so today you're going to meet a variety of mycologists who are excited to share fungal biology, identification, mushroom myths, and even cooking with you. So you'll all notice as you join that you are muted with your cameras turned off. Um, this is because we are hosting this via a Zoom webinar. So the chat option will remain open throughout the event, um, so you can use that respectfully. Um, but your video and your voices will not be heard throughout the event. Um, so the chat option will, will be there for you. Um, so if you have any questions for our scientist, please submit it through the Zoom chat. Um, and make sure that when you do that, you're addressing it to the everyone section so that we can all see your questions. Um, so one of our behind the scenes staff, um, one of my good friends and coworkers, Amy Hester is there. Um, so she's gonna be compiling the questions um, so that we can ask our scientists out loud periodically. In addition, we also have a few of our fungi experts in the chat. Um, you'll see uh, Lichen Laurel and mycologist Nicole in there who will answer some of your questions in the chat as we go on. Um, so one thing we wanted to mention that uh, just something to keep in mind, uh, always remember that members of the public should never consume wild mushrooms that they cannot positively identify as edible. And we'll be talking about that more as the program comes on, but just something to just put that in there right at the beginning. Um, so when in doubt, throw it out. Um, when the event is over today, please consider filling out the survey that we're gonna post in the chat. Um, it'll also be sent out in your email. The survey will help us plan more virtual events in the future, so it'd be really awesome if you can help us out with that. Um, we'll also be posting the resources discussed throughout this event um, on the museum webpage. They're already there now. Um, and Amy will also be posting that in the chat, the link to that in the chat so that you guys can click on it. Um, I believe she just posted it now. Um, so with that, let's get started. Um, so as I ask you a poll, which you guys can click on um, within the webinar, um, our scientists are going to introduce yourselves. Um, so we are going to start with Matt. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Matthew Smith, and I'm a fungal biologist and associate professor in the Department of Plant Pathology. And I also serve as the curator for the fungus collection, and I teach about fungi, and I'm basically really into them, so I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I study all different kinds of fungi in my lab, but I'm especially in love with truffle fungi. So uh, we won't talk about them a lot, but, but we'll slip them in a little bit. Uh, the next mycologist is going to tell you about herself, Roseanne. Hi, I'm Roseanne Healy. I'm a mycologist at the University of Florida, where I was involved with the plant pathology teaching program and collections management for the fungal herbarium since 2016. Now I'm doing full-time research on cup fungi, which include things like morels, saddle fungi, and truffles. And my research focuses on fungal relationships, particularly for the cup fungi. 
I'm most interested in how these fungi have moved around the world in the past and in the traits that have fostered their ability to adapt to climate change and new habitats. And now Alia is going to introduce himself. Hi everybody, I'm Alia Mujic and I am an assistant professor at California State University, Fresno. Um, hi everybody who's here from Fresno. Um, so I am involved with this crew because I have previously been a postdoctoral associate in Dr. Smith's lab, who's here as our uh, introduced as the first panelist. And I'm also a co-founder of uh, Falafel, the Florida Academic Lichen and Fungi Enthusiasts League. Um, so I no longer serve any, any capacity for them other than avid um, follower and volunteer from time to time. So I also study um, truffles and I study fungi in general from many different angles, fungal biology, but physiology, ecology, and evolutionary biology, like um, evolu evolutionary relationships. I'm especially interested in ectomycorrhizal fungi, those fungi that associate with the roots of trees and trade nutrition. So that's enough for me for now. Uh, I'll talk more with y'all later and glad to be here. I'll pass it on to Ross. Hi everyone, uh, glad you all could make it and uh, happy to learn all about uh, fungi together. Uh, my name is Ross Joseph. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Microbiology and Cell Science here at the University of Florida. And I work in Dr. Nemat Kehani's lab and we uh, research fungi that infect insects and also plants. And we also work on fungi that are symbiotic with insects and plants. And so in these systems, we're particularly interested in the genetic and molecular mechanisms of how these fungi are actually able to sense and interact with their host organisms. So in particular, I work with a fungi called Raphaelia loricola, and this is a fungus that is symbiotic with a small species of beetles called ambrosia beetles and pathogenic with trees and the family Loraceae. So we'll get into this a little bit later uh, briefly, but I'm, I'm very excited to be here and to uh, participate in this fungal event. I'm also the, the current acting president of Falafel, so uh, I'm very happy to see everybody coming in and showing interest. So I'll, with that, I'll pass it on to Sarah. All right, um, thank you, Ross. Thank you, everybody. So I'm gonna pass it back to Ross to kick it off with some fungal biology. Okay, great. So um, as the name would suggest, uh, this event focuses largely on mushrooms, but actually to put everything into uh, the proper perspective and context starting out, um, I'd like to begin by talking about fungi more generally. And this is actually a very important distinction because what we see when we look at a mushroom uh, is actually just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the whole organism. The real bulk of a fungus actually exists as microscopic cells that are often hidden out of sight. Uh, these minuscule cells can come in some different forms. So for instance, many fungi can live as individual cells uh, and which we would call yeasts. And you can see these on the, the left of the slide over here. These yeasts include uh, things like Baker's yeast, which is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this is a fungus that's responsible for making lots of uh, yummy food products that we like such as beer and bread. And by contrast, uh, fungi can also take the form of multicellular organisms, and these are commonly referred to as molds. So in this case, fungi grow as long thread-like groupings of cells called hyphae, like you can see on the right of the slide here. And as they grow, these hyphae form dense networks that are almost like a meshwork. And we call this whole meshwork of hyphae the mycelium. Now this mycelium is the body of the fungus, actually, and you can frequently see it uh, in soil, if you disturb it, on logs or in leaf litter, if you pick up some leaves and you see these white threads kind of going all over the place, that's mycelium. And it is from this mycelium that mushrooms actually grow and are produced. So at this point, you may be asking then, if the mycelium is the body of the fungus, what are mushrooms? And to answer this question, I'd like to put forth the following analogy. Mushrooms are to fungi as apples are to trees. Now, of course, uh, there's a little more nuance to it than this, but the simple answer is that mushrooms are structures that a fungus produces in order to create and disperse its spores, just as an apple is a tree's way of making and dispersing its seeds. Uh, but of course, fungi are not plants. In fact, they are evolutionarily more closely related to animals than they are to plants. 
and this fact is reflected in many aspects of their biology. One of these major aspects relates to how fungi obtain their food. You see, plants are able to make their own food using carbon dioxide and energy from the sun in a process called autotrophy, but like animals, fungi must get their energy by consuming other organisms in a process called heterotrophy. And there's a key difference between how animals and fungi are able to do this though. While animals consume things by bringing them into their body to digest, fungi digest their food externally, breaking it down in the environment so that they can absorb the nutrients back into their, bo into their bodies. This need to break down material for nutrition uh, is one of the reasons why fungi are such prolific decomposers. And fungi that break down material that is already dead as a food source are called saprobes, but there are actually many other ways that a fungus can get a meal. Fungi can act as pathogens and parasites by actively infecting and killing living organisms such as plants, insects, or animals. Uh, on the flip side, they can also form beneficial partnerships with hosts called symbioses. And in these situations, animals and plants uh, live in harmony with the fungus uh, and the result in the fungus being fed and in return the fungus providing some kind of benefit to their hosts, whether it be nutritious or uh, defensive, something like that. Uh, and to complicate matters even further, these groups are actually not mutually exclusive and many fungi can be found to occupy multiple of these uh, nutritional niches at different stages of their life cycles. It all comes down to context. One great example of this is actually the fungus that I work on in my lab called Raphaelia loricola. Uh, this fungus forms an obligate symbiosis with ambrosia beetles and the pair live inside of tunnels that the beetle excavates in trees. The fungus relies on the beetle for dispersal to new environments such as new trees and in turn the, the fungus serves as the sole food source for the beetles. So the beetles are actually carrying this fungus around with them and farming it inside of the trees. However, in the United States, trees colonized by this fungus contract a devastating disease known as laurel wilt, which can cause rapid death in laurel trees. This group includes agriculturally relevant trees such as avocado, as well as many species of forest trees. And so understanding how this fungus is able to interact in all of these different ways with its different hosts is crucial to understanding the, the pathosystem as a whole and trying to stop the spread of the disease both through environments and through individual trees. So this is one of the reasons why kind of understanding how fungi interact with their environment and interact with different hosts can be uh, really both interesting and very important in a practical sense. So on that, I'm going to throw things over to Roseanne, and she's going to talk a little bit more about fungal reproduction. I'm sorry, that was muted the whole time. Most fungi reproduce themselves through their spores, which are like microscopic seeds that contain a copy of the genetic matter from one parent or a combination of genetic matter from two parents. Things like molds and yeast, which Ross just told you a little bit about, produce trillions of spores, which we are usually unaware of, because their fruiting structures are microscopic or inconspicuous. The types of fruiting structures we are able to see are mushrooms, boletes, cup fungi, polypores, puffballs, etc. And these are often the only manifestation of a fungal species that make us aware of their presence. There are also the structures that help us to identify what they are. One of the first things that a mushroom identification key will ask is what color are the spores? Once in a while, a mushroom will leave a spore print where it is fruiting, as you can see on the armillaria cap underneath two other armillaria caps. But we're usually not that lucky, so we need to make a spore print to tell us what color the spores are in mass, because you can't always tell by looking at the gills what color the spores are, since the gills themselves may be a different color than the spores. Most mushrooms, boletes, and cup fungi, and other fungal fruiting bodies forcibly discharge their spores, which is how they get their spores out <clears throat> into the air currents to float away from the fruit bodies that produce them. We take advantage of that, that principle when we're making a spore print. To make a spore print, you need to collect your mushroom or bolete fresh. Don't refrigerate it because it might, make a, might not make a spore print after being so cold. 
Choose a cap from your collection that is mature, but not too old. If it isn't mature, there will be no spores to make a print. And if it's too old, it may be too dried out to make a print. Also, in the case of a bowl eat like this, now is an opportunity to see if it changes color when you bruise it. Here you can see from a previous bruise down on the left-hand part that it did change a color, in this case, dark blue. And then you want, would want to note that. So you cut off the cap, lay it pour side down on white paper, cover it so that it doesn't dry out before it can shoot its spores, and leave it for at least four hours or overnight, and then check it. This bolete has dark brown spores. If you have a mushroom that you suspect might have white spores that would be hard to see against white paper, like this Amanita, you can choose a background where white will show up. Not everything shoots their spores like mushrooms, bolates, etc. Some are passively released from their basidia and rely on something like raindrops or small woodland animals to push on the fruit bodies, forcing their spores out, like this puffball. Others, like stinkhorns, trick flies into dispersing their spores for them by emitting foul odors that smell delicious to flies and beetles. Others, like truffles, also emit tantalizing odors that even attract humans, though we can't smell them when they're underground. However, woodland mammals can detect them and are important dispersers of these spores. They eat them and then usually carry the spores further away than the air currents in a woodland habitat can take them. Where the mammal defecates is where the truffle spores can germinate under the right conditions. There are other ways that fungi disperse their spores, but we could take a whole session ju just on spore dispersal. Fungi are evolutionarily closer to animals than plants. They belong to their own kingdom, just as plants do and animals do. This is a schematic of a tree of life based on DNA. Taking a look at it, we see that fungi and animals are closely related. Slime molds share an ancestor with animals and fungi, but are not animals or fungi. They're all in their own kingdoms. So if animals and fungi are closely related, are there any traits that tie animals and fungi together? There are a few, but they are not very obvious. For example, we store our carbohydrates, a source of our energy, as glycogen. Fungi do this as well. Plants store their carbohydrates as starch, which is different. Fungi have chitin in their cell walls, which is a component of the exoskeleton of insects. The earliest derived lineages of fungi, like the ones that are causing a devastating disease in amphibians, produce cells with a single flagellum, just as animal sperm cells do. Now we're going to take a break from talking about fungal biology to talking about how many species there are and about some favorite mushroom myths. All right, thank you, Roseanne. Let's take a look at our poll results. How many known or named species of fungi are there? All right, yeah, two thirds of uh, our participants are correct. There are more than 100,000 known or named species of fungi. So, uh, all right, Matt, let's kick it over to Matt. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk for a couple minutes uh, about fungal diversity. And I'm really glad to see that many of you knew that there are more than 100,000 species. Uh, so most of the described species of fungi are macroscopic, which just means you can see them with your naked eye. And so we can pick them up, we can look at them in the lab and they're, they're easy to find, but there's actually a lot of other fungi where you need a microscope to be able to look at them. And 100,000 species, it kind of sounds like a lot, but actually when we look really carefully at fungi and also especially when we use um, data based on DNA sequencing, which Ali is gonna talk about in just a minute, um, from some substrates like soil, we know that there's actually a lot more than 100,000 species. The, most mycologists think that, there, that it's a reasonable estimate that there's between 1.5 and 5 million species, and there's some mycologists who think there's even more than 5 million species. So there's a couple of different reasons why that might be the case. This huge range and that we don't know 
um, as much as we would like to. So many species actually look the same. And even when you look at them very carefully, things that are different species might be hard to tell apart. So that's one of the reasons that fungi, it's really hard to tell how many species there are. The other thing is that we depend on fruiting bodies, even if they're small, fruiting structures are important for us to determine what species they are. And so a lot of fungi make their fruiting structures only for a short period of time and maybe only in a specific place during that short period of time and then they're gonna rot away. So if you're not there on the exact right day, in the exact right place, you can't collect those fungi. And that's different than plants where you can, you see a plant flowering and you wanna collect the seeds, you can go back to that same place, maybe in a month or something like that and find it. But for fungi, there's a lot of hit and miss uh, with that. So uh, I would say that the thing that I find really interesting about fungi is that we're really still in the age of discovery where we're learning a lot all the time. And that's part of what makes it really fun to be a fungal biologist. Ollie is gonna tell us a little bit more. Hi everybody. So um, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about, you know, why are fungi so hard to study? Uh, part of it is that fungi are hard to find, as Matt has just told us. Uh, you know, they're only there for just a moment. And if you don't catch it, if you don't catch that mushroom fruiting, you won't ever know the organism is there because it's living in some type of a substrate like wood or soil that you can't see into. And this is an image, what we're, you're seeing here is an image of the fungal tree of life. This is, to the best of our understanding, how the different phyla of fungi are related to one another. So the names you see here are phyla of kingdom fungi, and a phylum is just the classification level just under kingdom, for those who aren't familiar with all the biological jargon. Um, so the most of the fungi we know, the most diverse phyla of fungi, are those two at the bottom. They are ascomycota and basidiomycota. And you can see pointing on the tree right there, it says origin of complex sporocarps. You could say fruit bodies as well. Sporocarps is a fancy name for a fruit body or a mushroom. The reason those are probably the most diverse is because it's a sampling artifact. You know, this is like what we can see. It's what's easily seen. And you can see that the most of the kingdom fungi, all of those earlier diverging lineages that you see above, those tend to be, those phyla are smaller. We don't know as much of the diversity there. And that's probably because we just, haven't found them yet. And uh, there's a lot of places those fungi are hiding, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we're looking for them. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'm showing you two different uh, literature sources here, and I want to point out that on the cover of Science Journal right there, you can see in red is circled soils, the final frontier. Um, and that's because that's where a lot of the fungi are hiding. A lot of fungi, they don't ever make a big structure you can see with your naked eye. And they're just living in the soil, doing their thing, uh, supporting every terrestrial ecosystem. Uh, and we can't see them. And on the right, you see another image from this uh, paper out of Nature, another journal, scientific journal. And the green circles in these Venn diagrams represent the number of species that we have described to date. And this is a little out of date. You can see this is from like 2014, this image. Um, there's more now. The dark gray and the light gray circles outside of those green circles tell you kind of our estimated lower and upper bounds of what we think might be out there. And you can see for stuff like plants, plants are pretty well described. That green circle fills most of the gray. And it's in part because plants don't move. Plants are there, they're waiting for us and they're always up if they're up. Um, so if you're studying a plant, you wanna go back and learn more about it, you can just go back to it and see what's there just by looking. You can't do that with fungi. Animals, of course, there's a lot of diversity there. A lot of that is probably insects because animals are hard to see or uh, insects are hard to see and find and describe. And fungi, the amount of diversity that exists that we don't know about yet is just huge. Um, so it's an exciting time to be a mycologist. And a big part of what we're doing is finding techniques to look at things like soil that are hard to study and hard to find fungi in. So if you show the next slide, please. Part of the way we're looking in soil and studying fungi in soil is using DNA technologies. And we go out into the environment, we get DNA out of the soil, and then using various different techniques, uh, genetic techniques, 
we sequence all the fungi that are in there. So you can see we're getting a cell with a nucleus and the chromosome and there's your DNA. Then we use DNA sequencing to make a fungal barcode. And a barcode is just a region of the DNA, a part of the genome that we can use just like a fingerprint. The same way you would identify an individual person by their fingerprint, you can identify an individual species by these regions of the genome that we think of as a barcode. And we tend to use a 97% similarity as a cutoff. As with all things in biology, there's a little wiggle room. You know, nothing in life is black and white. There's always gray areas in between. And so there's a little variation that's natural. So 97% is what we use. And we compare that sequence that we got from the environment to a database. And there's a lot of these databases, some of them maintained federally, like the GenBank database of the National Center for Biotechnology uh, Information. Um, which is run uh, through the uh, government, through the National Institutes of Health, through the US government. Um, so once we've got a sequence, that doesn't mean we necessarily know what it is. It has to be in the database. So let's talk about that. How do things get in the database? Next slide, please. A big part of the work that I was doing as a postdoc in Matt's lab in Florida was looking at fungal diversity in Patagonia. So Patagonia is this region of Chile and Argentina and the southern ends. There are these beautiful temperate rainforests down there of trees and the, they're called southern beaches. And we were studying all the different fungi that are there. And you can see there's a lot of different forms here. There's mushroom-like forms, there's coral-like forms, there's some truffles in the bottom left. And there are these weird like ascomycete kind of brain-like, almost look like morels. Those aren't morels, it's a South American uh, relative that just kind of looks like a morel. Um, so, uh, we were out there collecting all these fungi because we wanted to know what was there. And so we put together some statistics. If we take a look at the next slide. And so what we did is we did a study and this was just the things that we could find because people had gone out into the environment and they had made a bunch of sequences and put them into the database just from soil, unknown fungi in the soil. And we went out and we collected field specimens that we could identify with uh, ID books and identify just by looking under the microscope because it was a mushroom we could hold in our hands. And what you see in this graph, this bar chart, you see on the uh, horizontal axis, the percent similarity of closest blast match. Blast is just the tool we use to search against the database. It's a search algorithm, uh, just like Google. Think of it like genetic Google. Um, and then the number of OTUs, OTUs are species, that stands for operational taxonomic units. Just because we don't know this is a species, it's just a sequence from the environment, we don't want to call it a species, we have that specialized term. But you can think of that as a species. And even in that highest percent similarity, that 97% to 100%, where we're fairly certain, okay, this is the same thing. We've got a sequence from our specimen and a sequence from the database, and out of those, 27%, almost a full third, were only known from environmental sequences. So even in the fungi that we can study easily by collecting them, these mushrooms we can go out and collect from the forest or from the fields, um, still there's a tremendous amount of unknown diversity just sitting right in front of us, waiting for us to look at it. So it's a lot of work. Anybody who uh, is interested in joining this field, it's a great time to do it. There's a lot of really interesting tools that are available just newly in the last decade or two. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to um, pass it on to a couple of select viewer questions. So some of the questions y'all have been posting in the chat. Take it away, y'all. Thanks, Alia. Um, and so we're going to have another time for questions here at the end, but we figured we'd go ahead and address some um, about halfway through the program. Um, so our first question, um, since Alia, you're, you're still on the, on the horn here, um, the first question I'm going to put to you. Um, so if there are so many undiscovered fungi, why did you go all the way to Patagonia to study them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'll start that question off and I might pass it on to Matt because Matt is really the, the um, kind of mastermind behind that whole project. Um, but the short story is that Patagonia is a remarkably understudied in terms of genetics. There's been a lot of mycologists there sampling and identifying things just by um, visual, you know, looking under a microscope and looking at the mushroom itself. But no one had ever gone and really done an in-depth sequencing of what was there. And we wanted to populate databases and understand the diversity of fungi in South America because South America doesn't exist in isolation. 
it was at one time connected to Africa and also to Australia and Antarctica. And we were looking to see the relationships between all of these different fungi between Southern hemisphere habitats. And it turns out they're actually pretty close. No one had really looked at the sequence data from South America. And that, that paper that I was showing in that last slide, if you're interested, you can go look that up and it'll tell you a little bit more about that work that we did. And if Matt has anything more to add, I'll pass it on to him. I don't know, he did a pretty great job. I was gonna say, yeah, the, it's a it's um, an area also where we had really great collaborators to work with. That's you know the only thing I would add is that there's some really great scientists there that we had an opportunity to work with, and that's critical for any kind of biodiversity inventory to have great cooperation with with excellent partners. Great. Um, so another question that came in is, can someone please explain what an anamorph is? And unfortunately, I cannot. <laughs> um, if Roseanne wants to address that, she has a lot of experience working on anamorph fungi, so I'm going to pass it to her and she Great. can tell a little bit more about that. So we're studying the anamorphs in the cup fungi, which haven't been known very much before using molecular methods. Um, but you're aware of anamorphs that have been used for medicines, such as penicillin comes from an anamorph, penicillium. Um, you're aware of a lot of diseases that have been caused by anamorphic fungi, but those are the things that we call molds and mildews. Um, but the anamorph is simply the um, clone of the parent, and it doesn't look like a fruiting body. It, but it does make spores, tiny, tiny, usually much tinier spores than a fruiting body would look would make. Does that answer your question? I think so. <laughs> we can um, have any follow-up questions added to the chat as well. Um, one more question, and this deals with a little bit more of biology. Um, so what came first, the lichen-like fungi or the mushroom? Anybody know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, would, I would say that's quite a complicated question. We might have to come back to that with a little <laughs> more detail. Um, but I will say that uh, fruiting bodies actually evolved multiple different times in different groups of fungi. We have evidence of that. And also lichen associations evolved several times independently in a bunch of different groups of fungi. And so it's hard to say exactly what is older, the, the fruiting body or the lichen. I guess I would, I would bet on fruiting bodies, but we maybe don't have the exact answer to the question yet. And it's actually pretty complicated and to go into detail might be too hard. But but I think it's suffice to say that they both have occurred, uh, have evolved a long time ago and multiple times for each one. Awesome, thank you, Matt. Sounds like we have some high thinking participants in this event, I love it. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions and we'll go on with the rest of the program. Um, but someone is asking why they might have white mushrooms in their yard that is only grass. Ah, that's a perfect timing for Alia because he has some white mushrooms that occurred on his grass in his front yard. And I'm guessing that you guys also might have this species. This species is called Chlorophyllum molybdites. It's certainly not the only uh, mushroom that you would find in a lawn, but it is definitely one of the most common ones, especially in Florida. And so sometimes there's other smaller fungi that you don't see, but I would say that one is very, very noticeable. It gets really big and it'll often make a big giant fairy ring. So it's hard to miss that one. And that's part of why, why it's in your yard or why you notice that it's in your yard is it's so big. That one is a saprobe, like, uh, like Ross was talking about, saprobes eat decaying matter. So that one's eating the decaying matter from your lawn when you cut your lawn. It's a common mushroom and it was fruiting this morning. I couldn't resist bringing it in. <laughs> in Fresno, it's the only mushroom we get right now, this time of year, uh, and only on watered lawns. And it's poisonous. Don't eat this one. It has green spinners. Yeah. Great. Thank you both. Um, and with that, while we're talking about identifying mushrooms and the have, how I already mentioned the importance of identifying mushrooms before choosing which ones you will eat and which ones you won't eat. Um, at this point, I think I'll turn it over to Matt to talk a little bit more about how to identify. So we told you that there's 
a lot of species of fungi. And that can make it really challenging to be able to identify them all. And so probably the most important tool that we have besides using DNA sequencing and microscopy is a very old fashioned tool. It's called a dichotomous key. And basically what that is, is it takes these very large numbers of decisions that you have to make about how species are uh, morphologically similar to each other. And it breaks it down to individual decisions where you have to make a choice between one thing and another thing. So in this case, uh, I have two different polypores. These are, these are hard, hard fruiting bodies that you might find on a tree. You can see that's the, that's the place where it was attached to the decaying wood or uh, a tree with a decay column in it. And in this case, I have two different polypores and that's the top and that's the bottom. So they both have pores all over the, the underside that are white, but the top is clearly a different color. So I might say in my key, uh, the top of the cap, that's a polypore mushroom, white, or some other color. And that would help me to make those decisions about uh, how to get my fungus of interest, how to identify my fungus of interest. I'm gonna take a couple seconds here to show you guys some other characters that are useful for mushroom identification. So this is one that uh, we discussed already. This right here is a bolete. So it's got a stalk and underneath it has pores, it's soft. And Roseanne showed you a picture and talked about how you can get a staining reaction on some fungi. So you can see that one is staining blue, right, as we watch. And if I cut it down the middle, a lot of them, the inside uh, might start off a certain color like yellow and then over time it might stain and this one's going to stain slowly on that part and quickly on this part and that's those are characters that I can use to help me identify my fungi. I'm going to show you a couple more characters really quickly. Uh, you can also use what we might call latex. Uh, this one might be a little bit hard to see but I'm going to give it a try anyway. So there's the mushroom and what you can see is it's got these very tight little gills and if I cut into those gills in this case, it's making a liquid. Hopefully you can see that. It's dripping down onto my computer keyboard. So I'm gonna try not to let that happen too bad. But you can see it's got, it's got that liquid and that's called latex. And that latex is another example of a character that we could use to identify a fungus. And I'm gonna show you one more example. In some cases, simple things like the size of a mushroom can be really diagnostic. Uh, I was lucky enough that I, I had a friend bring me a really spectacular mushroom uh, yesterday. This one is called Macrosopy Titans. And you can see uh, it's called Titans because it's really, really big. And in this case, uh, Macrosopy Titans has gills and it has a, has a stipe. And then it has this white cap, but also just the size alone. There's, this is the largest mushroom species that occurs in the Western Hemisphere. And just the size, if I, if I say, oh, your mushroom is more than two feet across, you know you're probably dealing, if you're in Florida, with Macrosomy titans. So it's the combination of all those features that we can use to, uh, to be able to identify fungi. Uh, so with that, I think that we're gonna go on to our poll. We have another poll that just popped up. And so if you can, if you can uh, click on that, then we're gonna talk about the results of our poll next. Matt, would you like to go ahead and share the video? Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. Let's it's share okay. the video first. I'm I didn't sorry want that to go un unviewed. What's that? No, I apologize. That was my fault. I skipped ahead. We're going to talk about some, uh, we're talking about microscopy next. And we're going to talk about how if you wanted to look inside of, the, of these gills to see what's going on, how would you do that? Hi, I'm going to show you some tips on preparing mushrooms for identification using microscopy. You'll need both a dissecting scope and a compound scope, and of course, some mushrooms. You also need a sharp, clean razor blade and a slide. First of all, you want to use as small a piece of gills as you can get because light on the compound scope won't go through thick material. You also need some water and a cover slip. You should select one gill and cut it from the cap. Ideally, you would cut the gills while looking through the dissecting scope. 
You can slice much, much thinner when the gills are magnified. Here I am cutting a transverse section so that you can see structures on the cap as well as the gills. You can also cut thin cross sections from the cap to the gill margin so that you can see the basidia and any sterile cells on the sides of the gill. Cut about 10 or 12 very thin slices under the dissecting scope. Here I'm cutting on the bench so you can see how it's done, but use a dissecting scope. I can't cut very thinly with the di without a dissecting scope either. After you've cut those sections, add a drop of water and agitate the gill slices, trying to isolate the thinnest ones and turn them so that you can see both sides of the gill rather than trying to look through the gill. Push them around and try to find the thinnest ones. Then you want to gently lower your cover slip and add some more water. And using your razor blade, you can help to lower the slide slowly to push out all of the air, which you usually don't. <laughs> so you need to push, push maybe with your razor blade again very gently to push out all of the air so that you don't have air bubbles in the way. And after the slip is on, you can push, you can um, take it to the compound scope and look at it. And here we're looking at some smooth spores under a 100x objective, but you can also see tuberculate spores, spiny spores with connections like this Laphomyces or this tuber spore, or you can see just spiny ones or spores that are merely bumpy. The ornamentations on gills are very important for distinguishing among species of fungi. So as you can see, microscopy can be very important for identifying fungi. We hope you enjoyed this quick video and basic tips with, about light microscopy. Thank you, Roseanne. Matt, did you want to add anything about microscopy before we move on to some mushroom myths? Uh, that's great. I just wanted to say that, yeah, part of the part of the challenges of working on fungi is that you really do need those microscopic features sometimes to identify things. Sometimes you can have closely related things um, and you can only use those microscopic features or, or DNA to tell them apart. And so that is a critical aspect of studying fungal biology. We also want to make sure we give a shout out to Matt's son who put together that awesome video for us. <laughs> yes, thank you, Finn. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, Sarah, do you want to tell us a little bit about some mushroom myths? Uh, yeah, can we get a look at the results of that final poll? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Wow, great. Um, a overwhelming majority of our participants acknowledged that picking a mushroom does not kill the fungus. So, great work. Y'all been reading up. So, um, I'm going to discuss some mushroom myths. I've participated in dozens of mushroom walks and fungal forays in addition to online identification forums and there are a few questions that always come up. So one of the first questions I hear is will the fungus hurt me? Do I need to wear gloves to examine this mushroom in my yard? Um, unlike some plants like I think poison ivy, Handling mushrooms is safe. Handling a mushroom is not gonna hurt you. You must consume a toxic mushroom to be poisoned by it. And then people often ask, well, I hurt the fungus. And as most of you acknowledge that the mushroom is the fruiting body or the reproductive structure of the fungus. And plucking a mushroom isn't like yanking up a sapling. It's more like picking a fruit off a tree like Ross covered earlier. Um, that being said, there's no reason to collect 50 of an unknown species. You can take three, four, five fruiting bodies to identify, especially if you can get them in different stages of growth, different stages of maturity that will help you with ID. Um, and of course, whenever you're collecting fungi, be respectful of the environment. Don't stomp all over everything. Um, another misconception is that all mushrooms that bruise or stain blue are psychoactive or psychedelic, and that is not true. It can be an indicator for some species, but it's not across the board. Like that bowl eat Matt showed us earlier, that stained blue. No, that's, that's not uh, a psychoactive mushroom. Uh, 
there's no shortcut, there's no tell to determining mushroom edibility or toxicity. You have to identify each mushroom before you consume it. Um, so speaking of consumption, let's turn it back over to Alia to show us how to cook confirmed edible mushrooms. Hi everybody. So yes, uh, I started my career as a mycologist, not as a scientist, but as a chef. Um, so I worked in catering and was really interested in learning how to collect and cook wild mushrooms from my table. And I started asking all these questions of my teachers like, you know, why does it only grow this time of year? And why only with this tree? And why only when this other mushroom is fruiting? And they said, gosh, you know, I don't think anybody knows and you're kind of bugging us. <laughs> so why don't you go figure it out? And that started my career as a scientist. Um, but I was first collecting for the table. And the image you see here, this is a chanterelle. If you're familiar with wild edible mushrooms, chanterelle is the French name and there's myriad names for this fungus because some version of this fungus, some member of the genus Cantharellus, which this is in, grows almost everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere uh, where there are temperate forests and some tropical. Um, so this particular mushroom is big. You can see that's a colander. For those of you out east, you may not be familiar with this particular chanterelle. This is the California chanterelle, uh, Cantharellus californicus, and it grows under our coastal live oaks that we have here in California, as well as some other oaks in the state. Um, it was the first wild edible mushroom I learned to pick. And I'll talk a little bit today, first about preservation, and then we'll talk about how to cook with wild mushrooms. So when you're preserving a mushroom, the most classic way of doing it, the way that most people think of is to dry them. And that works great. If you slice it thin, you know, slice the whole mushroom into slices no more than an inch thick, put them in the food dehydrator at the lowest temperature, and let them dehydrate for 24 to 48 hours, put them under glass where they won't get wet again, maybe freeze them for a few days to kill any uh, bugs or larvae that might be in there. And then that way you can make sure that your dried mushrooms don't just turn into powder as the beetle larvae that were waiting to eat them and survive the drying, just go back to eating them. Um, another way of preserving mushrooms that I really like is to freeze them. And that's especially appropriate for mushrooms like the chanterelle, which have a very heavy fiber to them. Um, in my humble gastronomic opinion, um, I don't believe that um, uh, drying is appropriate for a chanterelle because they, their fibery texture, they never quite rehydrate properly. They never get back that texture uh, that's so pleasing about the mushroom. And uh, part of that is that um, they, I would prefer to freeze them. So you have to first expel the water when you're doing that. And let's talk about that. So here's a chanterelle. Um, I've gone out into the field, I've collected it, I've cleaned them off, now I want to prepare them for eating. And this method I'm going to share with you is called the dry saute. I would recommend this for all mushrooms, not just wild mushrooms, because mushrooms are 98% water um, and by, by weight. And if you don't expel that water first and you put oil onto the mushroom, oil and water don't mix, right? So you're literally sealing the water into the mushroom and it never dries out. It'll never get crispy as a result. Like for those of you who like making hash browns, for example, you usually want to dry your ground potatoes, your um, grated potatoes down so that they get crispy in the oil, right? Mushrooms are no different. And for many people who don't like eating mushrooms, they'll tell me, oh gosh, like, oh, the textures, like slugs, they're terrible. I would argue that um, that's mostly a cooking method. You don't have to eat a sluggy mushroom. They can be quite crispy and firm if you dry them out first. So next slide, please. Um, I like working with cast iron. So, um, and these are not my images. If someone here, given the mycophilic community we have, you might know who took these pictures. And thank you um, for taking them. I found these on the internet a ways back and it's such a great demonstration of the dry saute method. So here's the mushroom cut up in a pan. And uh, the first thing you do, there's no oil, I might add a little salt at this stage to help draw the moisture out of the mushroom and then the highest possible heat. Next slide, please. After a few moments, so here are those same chunks of mushroom. They're starting to weep out their moisture. You can see the bubbles around the edge. That's all moisture coming out. I was told by one of my cooking teachers that um, a mushroom should scream when you're cooking it. <laughs> and I think that's a, a fun way of putting it because uh, the mushrooms squeak. The, the heat should be so high on the pan and the water should be dumping out so quickly that the mushrooms actually squeak as the, the water turns to steam touching the pan. And once the water dries up, next slide, you can see that it's really filling. You get a lot of this water. You can pour that off 
and use it for a seasoning or a stock. Like if you want to add a little moisture back to another dish and give this wonderful chanterelle flavor, you can do that or any mushroom. This works great with any mushroom. But the next slide will show us uh, that they've dried out. So you can see there's no water left in the pan. That's when you add the oil. And before adding the oil, if I was going to preserve those mushrooms, I would just pull them off. No oil, no nothing. Put them in a rack and put them in the freezer to freeze. And then when they're frozen, scrape them off the rack into a bag. And you can just grab handfuls as you like and use them in cooking, um, uh, whatever recipe you're doing. And a lot of mushroom flavors are fat soluble. So the flavors go into the oil and they go into like a classic preparation for chanterelles is in eggs or a cream of mushroom soup, something that'll take that subtle flavor. And for those of you familiar with chanterelles, they have kind of an apricot uh, floral aroma to them. It's just wonderful. It goes through the milk or whatever fat you're using to make your cream in your cream of mushroom soup. So next slide. And so here you can see they're, they're cooking down a little bit, they're cooking down a little bit. And these are pretty small. You know, these are way smaller than they were before. And uh, then uh, you can see if you look at the next slide. So this is the finished product. Remember how big those mushrooms were. In a moment, we'll look at the, the first slide again. And you can see that these mushrooms cook down a lot. All of what's been lost is moisture. And what you've kept is flavor. Um, you can do all kinds of stuff with this at this point. I would set those aside, cook whatever else I'm going to cook for the meal, and then incorporate those back toward the end. Um, you could also can them. Canning mushrooms in olive oil and vinegar is a fantastic way to preserve mushrooms. And there's some really wonderful Italian canned mushroom recipes I would really recommend. You can Google it. I won't tell you here, but let's look once more in the next slide. And there were the originals. So that was what they looked like to begin with. And just compare that, how much volume they've lost and how much flavor you've saved. So I love cooking mushrooms. If people want to ask about cooking mushrooms, you can put questions in the chat, but um, I'm going to kind of wrap things up with my uh, cooking demonstration. And let's take some questions from the audience. I think that there's probably a lot of good questions that we can address for y'all. Thank you, Alia. Yeah, so it looks like we have about eight minutes, which is not a lot of time for the amount of questions that you guys have been submitting. Um, but we'll go ahead and try to, try to get to some of these now. Um, so for the first question, um, which I think that We've addressed a little bit throughout the event, but let's just um, reiterate the importance of identifying mushrooms. So someone asked, um, some, where did my question go? Um, <laughs> someone asked, um, are all truffles edible? And how do you know if something is going to be poisonous or not? Uh, that, well, I, I think that the most important thing that I want everybody to know, especially as one of the poison control contacts, and there are several of us here who end up um, getting contacted about potentially poisonous mushrooms, is there's really no substitute for identifying that fungus all the way to species, um, or at least definitely to the group to make sure that it is 100% edible. And if you're not 100% sure, my very strong recommendation is you can, you can identify something once and then just throw it out and then identify it again to make sure you really know that fungus before you eat it. Um, people wouldn't walk out in the woods and randomly select berries and pop them in their mouth. So you shouldn't do it for fungi either. And as I said, there's a lot of species so they can be challenging. So it's just like anything you wanna, you really wanna practice, um, get, you wanna look online for resources. You wanna connect with people at Falafel and there's some really great books for our area as well, which can help you learn how to identify mushrooms. Um, and so check out some of the links that we have on the website. We have several links for helping people learn how to identify mushrooms better. Um, and there are some keys so you can learn about how to, uh, how to use a dichotomous key, which is a really important feature. Maybe there was something else that you asked that I didn't answer, Chelsea, did that, did that answer it? Our, well, since you're the truffle guy, can you tell us oh. if all truffles are edible? So, so truffles, uh, there are different kinds of truffles. I refer to truffles as all the fungi that fruit underground and they make their spores inside of a closed body. So all of the things that fit into that uh, category, I would refer to as truffles. Sometimes when people are talking about truffles, they're really referring just to the genus tuber, which is one particular genus. And I would say all of the tubers are edible. Some of them 
aren't very tasty and others are very tasty. So it just depends, again, on the species that you're talking about. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to move a little bit away from um, eating mushrooms now. And we, this is kind of a big picture question. So I want all our panelists using their, their noggins. Um, but someone in the chat has asked, would you please comment on the effects of global warming events thus far on the planet-wide distribution and evolution of fungi? Um, and the second part of that question is, do you envision fungi as being a significant food source in the future? Anyone want to tackle that one? I will go ahead and I guess maybe I'll answer the first question and then other sure. people can chime in if they want. Um, I would say one of the big challenges for studying fungi is that there are so many species and we know so very little about most of the species that has been a real um, challenge for measuring the impact of things like climate change. So for example, if you only know 10 or 15% of the species, it's very hard to say um, how those fungi are, if they don't even have a name and people have never really spent time studying how they get energy, it makes it very hard to say. Um, there are some exceptions of very well studied fungi. And so for those, uh, we can say that fungi are just like other animals and plants and other organisms where probably some might benefit from warming, but in general, because of habitat degradation, probably on average, they're gonna have a lot of the same problems that, uh, that plants and animals are going to have from warming. So that's, that's my, my personal answer to the first question. I don't know if anyone else has more to add to that. Anyone else want to comment? Or we'll move on to another question. I would add just a brief caveat to, to what Matt has said, and that is that um, part of the way we're studying climate change on the, uh, the effect of it upon fungi is looking at altitude. And there was actually a really great study that Matt and I were on that was uh, produced primarily by our friend and colleague, Dr. Camille Trong at the University, um, Autonomous University of Mexico in Mexico City. And uh, looking at just gradients and altitude, you follow the trees and the mushrooms up the slope and see how they change based on temperature difference. And we found, yes, absolutely. The communities of fungi colonizing trees and the roots of trees living in the forests change with changing temperatures. So we're likely to see big habitat shifts. And in terms of will fungi be an important food source in the future? The future is here. <laughs> <laughs> There's a food source already. A lot of things that you might not realize that you're eating every day are actually fungal products. Bread, bread's a fungal product. Bread is one of the first fermented foods and one of the most important cultural foods for Western civilization. Um, huge, huge impact on food productivity is yeast. That's a fungus. Um, a lot of protein sources come from fungi. I could go on and on. I like talking about food. Great. Um, so all, oh, sorry. Oh, go for it, Ross. I, I just wanted to add that in addition to uh, direct changes for climate change on fungi themselves, uh, climate change has a huge impact on host species for fungi, for instance, insects. So as climates warm in some places, uh, it, insect population ranges are are changing and with that populations of fungi are changing and it can lead to some unexpected outcomes. Awesome. So I'm just going to answer, um, we'll do one more question here. Um, and the question is just asking any, um, any ideas for lists of books, um, what's good for using to identify mushrooms, um, any resources. Um, if Amy could post in the chat again, the, the link to the website where we can find our resources for this program but any other um, recommendations for how people can continue learning about mushrooms would be awesome. And this can go to anybody. Uh, I can say that my uh, introduction to learning how to identify fungi in the wild that I see uh, was actually mostly through internet resources such as Facebook groups like the Mushroom Identification Forum, Falafel, the Florida Mushroom Identification Forum. These are all really great resources because it's a community of people. Some are very knowledgeable and some are looking to gain knowledge and it's just a place where people can freely exchange ideas. And so those kinds of resources are very helpful. Awesome, thank you. Um, so just to close out, I wanted to thank everyone for attending today. This was awesome. I did not expect to get this many registrants. So we are very excited about that. Um, I also want to thank all of our panelists. Um, if everyone can give them a round of applause from their homes, 
um, or type it in the chat. We can't see that part, um, but we cannot see you, which hopefully next time we have a program like this, we'll be able to see all of your faces. Um, and just as a reminder, um, if you had any questions that didn't get answered here today, you can go ahead and um, put those in the comment section of the survey. Um, Amy will post this link to the survey in the chat, um, but I know there's a lot of stuff going on on the chat right now. So it'll also be emailed to you. Um, it should also pop up when I close this chat. So thanks again for everyone and we hope to see you again soon. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.